I'm going to mute some folks just so uh, we don't get any feedback during this uh, this time. Uh, so welcome to our second in the series of talking about our recipe cards for how to bring birds to your yard. Uh, today we'll be talking about how to attract Lucy's warblers to your yard. Uh, and this is timed right around the time when we're going to see Lucy's warblers returning to Tucson. Uh, so we want to make sure that you're taking advantage of all these uh, different secrets that Olia has for us um, to make sure you're making your yard as friendly as possible for these, uh, these cute birds. Um, so I'm going to introduce our speaker, Olia Phillips, uh, who is our community science coordinator, uh, and Jenny McFarland as well, who will be sharing more about our Habitat Home program towards the end of the presentation. Um, first, I will go over some of our Zoom tips. So for those who may have not used Zoom uh, before, um, we're going to ask you to keep your uh, yourself muted, which you can find the mute button if you're on a computer. It's at bottom of your screen, uh, maybe elsewhere if you're on a tablet. But um, since it's a presentation, we just ask that you keep yourself muted for, uh, for that today until we get to um, the time for questions. There is a chat uh, function on Zoom that you can use to put your questions in at any time, or you can message me directly if you're having technical problems. Um, feel free to use that throughout the entire talk and we can get to some of those questions at the end. You'll also have a chance to unmute yourself and ask questions as well. Um, so I believe that's it. Um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Olia here, um, who will talk about our Lucy's Warblers. Thank you so much. I'm so excited for this talk. I never get tired of talking about Lucy's Warblers. They're one of my favorite birds ever, just because we've learned so much about them and I got to um, study them so closely. They're awesome little birds and I'll tell you a little bit more about them. And we'll have plenty of um, time for questions at the end too. I, I made sure to save some time. So this is uh, the second talk uh, under the series of new recipe card talks. If you didn't catch the first one a few weeks ago, you can find it on our YouTube channel. It's about attracting crested cuties to your yard. So that's your cardinals, phenopeplas, perloxia. Um, and our next one will be on pollinators in March, and I'll share that date with you at the end. So what are these recipe cards? Uh, this is what we began to kind of call them because we provide the ingredients to a perfect yard to attract a specific group of birds, or in this case, a specific species. You can find uh, these and more at our nature shop. This particular card is all you need to know about Lucy's warblers. They're a big focus species for us uh, with the nest box program. So we often get the question, of, well, how do I attract Lucy's warbler to my yard? Is there anything else I can do? Well, they're insect eaters, so it's not as easy as setting out a block of seed for them, but there are things that you can do to make your yard more desirable for Lucy's warblers, and I'll go over that now. So let's dive right in. Lucy's warblers are easy to ID once you know what to look for. Um, they're small and gray, about the size of a burden, and but they don't have that yellow head of a burden. Instead, the male has a rusty cap on top. You can see it here puffed up. The female doesn't actually have a cap or, ha or she has a slight cap, but oftentimes you won't even see the cap unless uh, the bird is excited, like this male in the middle. They also have a rusty rump. That's the area right above the tail. Same color, that's a little bit more visible. But again, when Lucy's are up there in the tree, it's kind of hard to see these field marks. The best thing you can do is recognize them by their song, which you'll start hearing pretty soon here in March. It's gonna fill up Tucson and surrounding areas. I'm gonna play you a little clip here. Uh, right, and it's kind of like a bit of a trill song. Two pitch changes there. It kind of goes up and then down. Sometimes you do up, down, up. 
carrying that all over my presentation here. So Lucy's warblers used to be called mesquite warblers due to their close ties to this native tree. And some refer to them as desert warblers as well because they nest in some of the driest parts of the Sonoran Desert. But who's Lucy? Uh, Lucy's warbler was named by William Cooper for Lucy Hunter Baird. She was the daughter of Spencer Fullerton Baird. Cooper was not a collector, but he was a zoologist and one of the founders for New York Lyceum of Natural History. Well, Cooper, he did not collect the birds, but he did have the specimen sent to him. So he was he had the privilege of naming some of them and he named one for the daughter of his associate, Spencer Fullerton. Lucy the, herself, the daughter, actually developed her own um, expertise in natural history and exhibited a lifelong commitment to science. So that's kind of interesting. Lucy's warblers are adorable, yes, but they're also very unique. Uh, they're one of only two cavity nesting warblers in North America. Um, the other being the prothonotary warbler, which we don't actually get over here. They also are the only warbler to nest in the lowland desert environment. Some of the, the dry, driest parts, like I mentioned earlier. Lucy's warblers have also a very small distribution range compared to some of the other species. They winter on the west coast of Mexico, but beginning about mid-March, you'll start seeing them arrive into Arizona in big numbers. Um, Arizona is right in the heart of their breeding range, especially Tucson, marked here by the little star. Based on eBird observations, though, their breeding range is expanding into southern parts of surrounding states of California, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico. So that's interesting. Lucy's warblers breed most often in dense lowland riparian mesquite bosques, or in other words, a woodland mesquite. They are also found in Palo Verde, ironwood, cottonwood among other species, but their ties are the strongest to mesquite trees. Lucy's warblers overwinter in Mexico uh, in similar lowland riparian habitat, though some Lucy's do stick around Tucson, but very few do. Lucy's warblers spend almost all of their time in tree canopies foraging and nesting so that's where you'll find them in your yard. And whenever you go out into parks, that's where you should um, keep an eye out for them. Lucy's are insectivores. They are what is called foliage gleaners. So they spend a lot of time looking around the canopy of the tree, looking for small bugs that are hiding in the flowers, in the um, leaves. They eat primarily caterpillars and small winged insects, like in this picture. So in this picture, you see this, it looks kind of big, but it's tiny, tiny caterpillar. Uh, I believe it's like a moth species. And then it has another prey item here. It's some kind of a leaf hopper, small little bug, tiny, tiny bugs, but that you might not notice in the mesquite tree, but they're all over during spring springtime. They also eat um, spiders and beetles opportunistically whenever they find them. So currently, Lucy's warblers are identified as a species of conservation concern by Arizona Game and Fish, and uh, they're also a focus species for important bird areas. Like most other species, Lucy's warblers suffer from habitat destruction in their breeding range and beyond. Large cavity bearing mesquites have become much more scarce due to firewood harvest, um, declining water tables, development, and over pruning in urban areas. This is especially important since Lucy's love um, mature large mesquite trees, but those often become hazardous in urban conditions, so they do get pruned up. Urban mesquites are capable of providing sufficient foraging opportunities, but the lack of cavities often causes the birds to move on to other areas. 
They're also known to use smaller uh, saguaro cavities, but those are already in great demand by other cavity nesting nesters in our area. So with an addition of a nest box, that which, which I will talk about later, um, with an addition of a nest box in urban and suburban areas, we can provide that cavity for them to nest in and have a, a great spot for them to forage as well. So that's an important part of Habitat at Home, which is providing a safe place to nest. Lucy's have close ties to mesquite trees. Uh, they use them for nesting and foraging. Lucy's are early nesters. They arrive in the Tucson area mid-March, like I mentioned before, and they get down to business pretty much right away. And by the end of March and beginning of April, you'll start seeing them build nests and start laying eggs. Their peak nesting activity is in April uh, through May, though some do finish up uh, mid-June as well. They have two broods per season, consisting of three to five um, eggs in a clutch. They're also a very dense nester for not being like a colonial nester um, that we're familiar with. So we actually documented them nesting just inches apart in perfect mesquite woodland. So that was an actually interesting discovery for us. Lucy's nest behind loose tree bark um, in splitting branches. This is what you'll see in a large old mesquite where the branch is getting so heavy that it just buckles under its own weight and splits. And the nests are off, uh, they're overlooked so often because they just look like a clump of debris. So this is a Lucy's warbler nest you see here on the left. There's another one on the right. It just kind of looks like a bunch of debris stuck in there, but it's actually very intentional. The nest is consist, uh, consists of mostly mesquite petioles and small twigs, and then they line the cup of the nest with feathers of other species. We also um, recently got this grant from North American Bluebird Society to study Lucy's warbler nesting phenology using cameras. So a very non-intrusive way to see what is happening when we're not checking the nest boxes, right? So these aspects of Lucy's warbler lives are very poorly studied in literature currently, and they need much more documentation as well than exists currently. From the clips and the nests that we analyzed, we were able to put together this timeline. Keep in mind our sample size is small, but we uh, have five nests currently, but we hope, uh, we hope to strengthen this in, um, with additional observations this year. 2021 was a very challenging year for, for many species, including Lucy's warblers because of the drought. So this year, um, very hopeful for a nice, output of nest. So let's break it down uh, on this graphic. The nest building stage took 12 days uh, from when we started seeing Lucy's warblers bring nesting material to uh, when the first egg is laid. One egg is laid each day, so depending on how many eggs are in the clutch, it can take three to six days for them to complete their clutch. The average number of eggs that we've seen from all our nest boxes nest box studies is four. So about four days for that uh, stage to be complete. Incubation then lasted 15 days. So about two weeks there. Uh, uh, that's for until the first egg hatched. Female is the only one that incubates and the male feeds the female on the nest. We're able to see that on our live cameras. At least one chick always fledged on day 11 after hatching, which we thought was so interesting. It's kind of like they have a little timer going in, uh, internally, but the other chicks, it varied. Um, they followed the first chick within minutes, sometimes hours, and sometimes even days. One of them took three days to leave the nest after the first one left. We also found a second clutch within 10 days 
in a nest box adjacent to the first one. So they didn't decide to reuse that particular nest box for their second nest, but we do believe that it was the same pair based on territory and volunteer observations. For a long time, it was actually thought that Lucy's warblers don't use nest, box, not nest boxes. Just don't use them, period, unlike any other cavity nester that have been helped with the addition of a nest box trail, Lucy's were not thought to use nest boxes. In fact, it was just uh, because the right kind of nest box wasn't developed for them, and Tucson Audubon Society took on that task and conducted a multi-year uh, experiment where we tested 12 different designs in varying volume, um, shapes, sizes. It, it was all based on what we've seen them nest in, um, but the one that came out on top was our triangle box. Uh, we tested these boxes at 60 point locations and 70% of the time, the triangle design was selected by Lucy's Warblers. And the reason for that we believe is that this design was created specifically by mimicking their natural nest, which uh, I had showed at the beginning of that peeling bark and splitting branches where it's kind of hard to see it from the picture, but there's actually two points of exit in that type of nest. So the Lucy's Warblers can slip out from either the front or the back. And we did the same thing by designing this type of nest box. So now we have a nest box that is loved by Lucy's Warblers. And we can implement this into a conservation plan and bring more Lucy's Warblers into productive um, habitats, urban habitats. So this is where you come in. Uh, your yard is a good place for Lucy's Warblers. That's why we created a new recipe card to provide all the ingredients for Lucy's Warbler Friendly Yard. And I'll go over these in order and you can find these again at our nature shop and pick one up. The first one is a very important one. All of these are important, but this is um, life and death type of situation is it's extremely important to keep cats indoors not only for Lucy's warblers, but for all of wildlife, cats um, kill lizards, mammals, birds. They don't discriminate. Um, in the United States alone, 20, uh, 2.4 billion birds are killed by cats every year and 12 billion mammals every year. And so keeping cats indoors not only helps the local wildlife that's already suffering from other perils like habitat degradation, they have other things to deal with. But it also keeps your cats safe from predators, vehicles, and disease. If you'd like your cat to have some outdoor time, uh, you can build a catio, which is a cat patio, um, or take it on supervised, supervised leashed box. So that's some options there, but never just let your cats out roaming around. It's also important to avoid insecticides in your yard since warblers depend on insects for food. That is all they eat. Lucy's will depend on this for their survival. Like most desert species, warblers benefit from having supplemental water. So the sound and the look of moving water especially attracts them. Consider installing a fountain or even a water dish. Um, keep it clean and you'll have to refill it as well because as the months warm up, the water will be evaporating a little bit faster. And water really attracts a bigger variety of birds than feeders do in my opinion. So it, it's a good investment for a, a bird friendly yard. Here are some examples of water features. Uh, we have some, you know, from fancy water fountains to DIY bubblers. Moving water is good, but you can also start with a simple dish. Lucy's warblers and other small birds prefer to have a, a, a shallow edge or a thin border where they can safely grip to um, in order to get a drink. So you can consider that when you're selecting your next water feature, or you can add rocks to provide the same effect. 
This also protects little quail chicks from drowning if you have those guys around. And of course, install the triangle nest box designed specifically for Lucy's warbler needs. These are available at our nature shop um, and online for just $10 each. You can also make your own if you prefer. Uh, we have a plan listed on our website and I'll share a link in a follow-up email as well. We recommend that you install the nest box by the end of February so that it's nice and ready for the first Lucy's arrivals. But if you're running a little bit behind, you can safely put them out in the first week of March or so. Go in any later than that, and you may risk a Lucy's warbler passing by your yard to look for a different place to nest. So that's just what we recommend. But of course, it's never too late for next season. You want to install the nest box uh, in or near mesquite trees in a, a denser foliage. So that's often in branches rather than the trunk. We recommend six to 15 feet off the ground. That's like a big range, but higher is of the higher part of the range is better for a backyard setting so that you're not disturbing them whenever you're using the backyard or if you have dogs running around, um, some things like that. Make sure that you avoid Western sun exposure by installing the nest box east to north facing. Um, that just keeps them cooler in the afternoon. And as I mentioned, Lucy's are dense nesters in perfect mesquite woodland. In the backyard setting though, I would recommend spacing the nest boxes about 20 feet or more apart. You can use outdoor grade screws, which is what I recommend. The tree simply just work, uh, forms a scar over the, you know, the, the screw. And the tree, if you're using wire though, you can, but make sure that the nest box doesn't sway too much in the wind and make sure that you reattach the nest box every year or so to make sure that you don't strangle the branches as they grow um, with that wire. Each nest box comes with a direction sheet, including um, a little registration link. So I, I encourage you to register your nest box and we can see their distribution. And at the end of the season, I contact everyone who installed a nest box and get kind of a census of who has had a successful nest that year. And we can also map it out on our um, map there and see if we're actually bringing more birds or actually having more Lucy's in the urban settings. For upkeep of nest boxes, we recommend that you clean out the old nests after the breeding season is over, so in the fall or winter. You don't have to clean them out between two broods because it's just safer to do it at the end of the season because you don't know when they're actually done. Um, so you don't want to mess with that or discourage them from having a second brood there. You can also, um, you can clean out the nesting material by simply just taking it out of the nest box. You don't have to scrub it or pour any kind of cleaning solution in there. Uh, most of the stuff that we don't want in the nest box will come out with the nesting material itself. So that simply, it kind of gives them a fresh start and free of any nest parasites. Then we make sure that the nest box is still well secured and ready for the upcoming season. Of course, it's important to plant native plants for Lucy's warblers. Native plants do much better in our hot climate and they provide the best food source and shelter to our local birds. And the added benefit to you as a homeowner is that these plants don't require much water once they're established. So that's gonna help you in the long run too. If you're looking to plant a new shade tree or small ornamental bush, we have some suggestions here. Velvet mesquite, of course, for a velvet mesquite warbler, just mesquite warbler. Um, velvet mesquites grow up to 25 to 40 feet tall, so they're big trees. 
uh, great shade trees. They flower spring to summer with these clustered blooms you see um, the Lucy's feeding on. They attract so many tiny insects and it coincides with when Lucy's warblers are feeding their young. It's also important to plant native mesquites such as this velvet mesquite that I mentioned, not the Chilean mesquite or the Argentine mesquite that you, that's offered by some landscaping companies. Native mesquite trees have a much larger insect load than the non-native types. Our recipe card has a nice guide to ID the native velvet mesquite and the honey mesquite and the non-native Chilean and Argentine um, mesquites there. Native mesquites are excellent shade trees. Like I said, they provide that cover. And they're also, they have a very strong tap root that anchors them down into the soil. And that helps them into in the monsoonal storms and high winds that we experience oftentimes. Non-native mesquites are not like that. So you'll often see those toppled over easily. They're quite a few hybrids out there for sale. So make sure that you buy from reputable nurseries that can guarantee a native mesquite tree sapling. Then we have our blue Palo Verde, Arizona's, Arizona's state tree. It can grow up to 30 feet tall and spread up to 20 feet, 20 feet wide. It has bright green or blue green bark um, and some seasonal leaves. They also have beautiful yellow blooms in March and April. And if moisture is present, a few flowers open up through the summer months as well. Palo Verde is a great source of food and shelter for wildlife. Um, other species of birds like hummingbirds, morning doves, white-winged doves find them ideal for nesting and raising their young. Quail even roost in these trees for cover. And next we have ironwood. It's such an iconic tree. Honestly, it ranks among the most ecologically and economically important plant species in the region. Ironwood functions as the nurse plant by helping other plants establish below its dense canopy. They grow slow, but they make an excellent investment. They'll grow up to being 15 to 30 feet tall and have these gorgeous purple and white flowers in the spring. Very recognizable from far. Fairy duster is another great option for a small flowering bush. It attracts many insects, hummingbirds and butterflies love them. Um, it is a beautiful and very hardy plant that starts blooming as early as now. So keep an eye out for these. Sweet acacia, all oh, the smell of sweet acacia, it's intoxicating. Uh, it's one of the most popular residential trees out here. Another excellent provider of insects and pollen for our local wildlife. Uh, sweet acacia grows up to being 10 to 25 feet tall in that range. Uh, it's got bright yellow to orange flowers and they'll appear anywhere from April to even November in some areas. And finally, we have our desert willow. It has one of the most beautiful blossoms loved by hummingbirds and other birds. It grows anywhere from six to 30 feet tall. So you can have it as a bush or you can have it uh, train it into a tree by pruning. Um, it also is very popular in landscaping here. So those are some excellent options that not only benefit our Lucy's warblers, but also other birds. And by planting native plants, it benefits you as well in the long run. Of course, it's important to state that whenever we invite birds to enjoy our backyards, we have the responsibility of reducing hazards that may be present near buildings. We've already covered cats and insecticides, but another important one is prevention of window collisions. Every year, 365 million to a billion birds die due to window collisions in the US alone, and that's year after year. We offer some example solutions on our website. You can also see 
each of these windows at our Mason Center, if you visit us, it's a good time to visit also. It's nice and cool outside. Um, check them out for yourself. See what fits for your um, aesthetic needs as well as installation techniques, price points. Um, these price points begin at $2 and they're all listed on our website. We also offer these free window decal kits that can be picked up at our nature shop. Teresa shared earlier before the presentation that she put them up at her window and she hasn't had another window strike since then. So that's awesome to hear. And it's so encouraging to hear this feedback. Um, these are free, available at any time. The nature shop is open, come pick them up. They're just window vinyl. They don't damage the window. You can take them up, put them back on, do anything you'd like with them. More resources are available on the website, tucsonaudubon.org slash window dash strikes. I'll also share that in the follow-up email there. We started a whole new program in 2021 dedicated to prevention of window collisions and the education of the public. So don't hesitate to reach out to me with any questions and use our webpage as a resource as well. So to recap, in order to have a Lucy's friendly yard, you must keep your cats indoors, avoid insecticides, provide water, install a nest box, plant native plants and strike proof your windows. And many of you are already doing this. So this I'm excited for the spring season um, as I expect a lot of Lucy's, but hopefully we do get that. If you'd like to create more success and attract even more birds and insects into your yard, we encourage you to join our Habitat at Home program. And Jenny has a few words about the program um, here. I'm sorry, I mean, yes, yeah. The Habitat at Home program is part of our larger idea of uh, how we can all create urban bird habitat using our own yards, properties, business space, any, any space that we have control over the landscaping of to create habitat that is useful in an urban space for birds and wildlife. And this is part of a larger concept of uh, reconciliation ecology of trying to mitigate as much as we can um, the fact that habitat was lost due to creation of urban spaces, agricultural spaces, and you know, human spaces, and try to put some habitat usage back into these spaces that were removed from natural original habitat. So Habitat, Pro, uh, habitat Home Program here at Tucson Audubon does have a mission to create and enhance bird, pollinator, and wildlife habitat in urban landscapes through education, individual community participation, recognition, and restoration. But this is part of that larger concept of trying to mitigate loss of original habitat and the idea that if many people create small patches of habitat in their yards, it can create a network of patches of habitat throughout the Tucson Valley and throughout you know, Southeast Arizona. And this is especially important for birds like Lucy's warblers, where the importance of native plants really cannot be overstated. Native velvet mesquite is such a significant important resource for these birds where it's difficult for them to use a space if they don't have it. And if you're having trouble getting Lucy's nesting in your yards, it may be because there's just not enough native plants around. So planting a native mesquite and using our, the recipe card that Olya showed to see if the big mesquite in your yard is native or not is, is important, can be helpful. And if your neighbor has a native mesquite and you put a nest box in your yard, that can still work because the birds see this collection of yards as one big habitat patch. So. Um, the Habitat at Home program is organized into um, steps and layers to try to make it um, useful and easy for pretty much anybody who's interested to create some habitat at their home and make some homes for birds and, and pollinators and other wildlife. So um, we do have some four basic elements, which are the plants, water, home, homes and habitat, and protection, which is reducing hazards. So that's what Olia was getting at with the uh, the cats, keeping your cats indoors and window prevention, window strike prevention. Because if we're bringing birds into our yards, we don't want that to be a dangerous place for them. We don't want to lure them into a dangerous situation. So we do have our seven key components focusing on 
plants and, and water, which is especially significant out here in the desert and homes. And then we have levels. So we have the hummingbird level, goldfinch level, thrasher and uh, cardinal level, and these elevate. So yards, people, as you put more effort into your yard, you can elevate in your level of recognition for your habitat at home. And we really have put a lot of effort into making this program as accessible as possible to different um, people's abilities to participate. So this could be the based on you know, the size of your yard or the amount of income that you have to put into creating a habitat because it's not uh, always the least expensive thing. So our hummingbird level is set at a very low level in terms of commitment so that nearly anybody could participate. Even if you live in an apartment building where you don't even have a yard, you have a patio um, or like a balcony, you could still uh, participate by reducing a hazard, putting out a very simple water for wildlife, like a water dish, and even a few just nectar plants in a, in a hanging basket or on a, on a window box can, can be um, what you need to get into the Habitat at Home program because it is actually benefiting wildlife as you're part of a larger network. So this is a sample of the guide we have. And if you join Habitat at Home, you get resources like this. Go ahead, Olya. We've also added our a la carte menu. And this was a lot of fun for us, but also from the idea of trying to keep it fun and interesting for, for everyone, for the participants. So these are, we have specific things you can do that are less general than those original four levels to specifically help and target specific birds, wildlife, pollinators, or concepts. So we have our, our Monarch approved sticker. So this is planting um, plants, nectar sources, as well as caterpillar food sources specific for monarchs and other butterflies. And then our caterpillar approved uh, sticker to address the fact that it's easy to overlook that very specific plants are needed by caterpillars to, to, to feed on, to grow into butterflies. Uh, many people want to plant nectar plants to attract butterflies, but those caterpillars are a really important step as well. And then eating your plants is a good thing <laughs> if they're native caterpillars. And then our native bee approved um, a la carte sticker for helping native bees. So we want to draw a lot of attention to the fact that Southeast Arizona is one of the most diverse locations in the world for bees. And we're not talking about honeybees or the bees that live in a hive. Uh, those are introduced European honeybees. We have a huge diversity. It's over 1200 species of native bees that live here. And these are the little bees that pollinate our native flowers. And they're all sorts of like cactus bees and mallow bees. And they're really, really interesting insects. And they do need some help and support and they don't get in these big swarms and they don't do the things that we think of, of honeybees doing. They are solitary. The females have their own babies. They raise their own young themselves. They don't have a queen. They don't, that's not how they operate. And they're really very important for pollinating a lot of our native plants. And they do need a little bit of support. A lot of them nest in uh, bare ground. So having a section of your yard that's just uncovered soil, no gravel, no wood chips or anything on it is very helpful to 70% of those bees. And many uh, of them also nest in wood blocks, these bee boxes that you may have seen uh, people installing or you, we sell them in our gift shop as well. And those are really fun. You can hang those up and then see the little mama bees bringing resources to the, to the eggs they're laying inside for the babies to develop. It's, it's really quite fun. Uh, our moth approved card, since the very specific flowers and plants are very important for moths. And moths are a really important food resource for many other animals like bats. And then that leads to our bat approved card since really planting a lot of stuff for moths is very helpful to bats, especially um, those insect eating bats. And also planting agaves for like the nectar bats. We have lizard approved for uh, doing really targeted things to help lizards such as rock piles, uh, brush piles, and really reducing your use of insecticides since that's what the lizards eat. If you get rid of the insects, there's nothing for the lizards to eat. And then things that depend on the lizards like roadrunners don't have enough lizards. So it all, it all links together. And then our cavity nester approved um, a la carte menu item, which focuses on nest boxes and the little image there of the Lucy's Warbler nest box, but also other cavity nesters, uh, other birds, but also the native bees, those bee blocks. They're little tiny cavity nesters. So really keeping in mind the fact that, oh, I've kept my dead tree snag or 
which helps a lot of different cavity nesters. Uh, we really are trying to keep this as broad, as inclusive as possible, while also achieving goals that help um, these birds and wildlife. And then our Dark Skies Approved sticker, this is in partnership with Dark Skies International. We got sort of their recommended requirements. And this is to not only improve how much urban you know, light pollution there is by using specific types of lights and maybe timing lights or motion sensing lights um, for artificial light at night, but this also, there's a lot of evidence that dark, darker skies and urban settings improves human health as well. So this is a really interesting kind of large scale one where if many of us reduce our artificial light pollution, it could maybe help the whole, our whole community. And then our poison free sticker, which is focusing especially on insecticides and rodenticides, since those are very, very dangerous for um, a lot of birds and wildlife. And insects are such a key food source for many other animals. And um, herbicides were a little, we're not as, uh, that's a little more of a subtle situation since some, some herbicides are more dangerous than others and sometimes they are necessary. But it's the idea of being very mindful and very, care, very, very careful of when herbicides are used and especially those neonectide herbicides that you can get on those herbicides that are applied to like seeds as a, um, or baby plants. And those can be very dangerous for a lot of insects. Go ahead, Olia. Our restoration crew, which is a fantastic group of very dedicated, incredibly knowledgeable people, is here for you. They're here for our larger community, doing lots of great work, uh, removing, you know, we'll have all sorts of contracts, removing buffalo grass to help save saguaros in the future, and all sorts of really important on the ground work is happening, which is not a bonds restoration crew, but they are also available to help you directly. You can actually uh, find out more about hiring members of the restoration crew to come and install your habitat at home. And we've had a lot of great success stories from properties around Tucson, which is absolutely you know, unique and very interesting, beautiful, effective habitats were, uh, were installed in people's yards by our restoration crew. So if you'd like to know more about that, you can reach out to me um, or Carrie Hackney, who works here at Tucson Audubon, or Kim Mashashino, the habitat at home coordinator. Go ahead, Olya. So Habitat at Home, we are really doing everything we can to make this as effective and inclusive as possible. Um, we have an online registration. You can go and do this right online. It is a one-time fee. It's $35 for Tucson Audubon members, $45 for non-members. You do get this lovely uh, sort of, you know, eight, quite, quite large, like eight by 10 aluminum sign to put in your yard uh, to showcase the fact you're putting all this work into your yard to help birds and wildlife, as well as maybe encourage others to do it as well. Um, and you can also put your level, your stickers on there as you achieve different levels or a la carte items. We also have a step-by-step -step guide and additional reference materials. And we are working on more materials all the time to, to get to you guys, um, existing Habitat at Home members, as well as new members. We also have a program in the works to try to, we're, we, it's gonna happen. We're gonna be giving away Habitat at Home memberships to uh, people who maybe would have trouble affording that fee, as well as trying to get plants at zero cost into people who into people's yards who would have trouble buying plants, buying native plants. So we're really trying to increase our net and bring as many people and many households into this concept and program as possible. And uh, if you have any questions, concerns, or you're reaching new habitat levels, just reach out to, to me or Kim Ashishina. Thank you so much, Jenny. Yeah, you're very welcome. So as I mentioned earlier, this is the second recipe card in the series of what we're going to be talking about. These are all already available at the Nature Shop for you to pick up, um, but the Zoom presentations specific to each um, recipe card are still happening. We have our next one on March 14th, dedicated to pollinators, attracting pollinators to your yard. So keep an eye out for a registration link. It's not out just yet, but it will be soon. Then we have our Greater Roadrunners and Creatures of the Night presentations coming up later this year. So if you have any questions, please let us know. I'm happy to answer some questions. And if you have anything that comes up later, uh, we will have our emails included in the follow-up email if you wanted to reach out to us directly. 
So I'm going to stop sharing now so I can see everybody's faces. Do we have any questions here? Thank you so much, Olya and Jenny. That was really fantastic. Uh, we do have a few questions in the chat. Uh, let me just see. I know Jenny has been answering a lot of them, which is really helpful. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, there was there's one that would just came in I'd like to address. So who Absolutely. at Audubon Society determines if your yard is habitat approved? We don't physically go to your yard and, and do like an approval process. Um, you can hire just not, you know, just not about to come out and do a consultation process if you'd like, if you're looking for like specific recommendations on how to do your yard, but that's a different process. We do do a survey. So people will uh, tell us what's going on with their yard. And we do ask for photos, but it's not like you have, you would expect anyone to come to your yard and like check up on you. This is uh, empowering people with information as well as recognition to make the yards as good as possible. We're not going to be you know, policing you at all, nothing like that at all. But um, the different levels is based on information you give us that you, you, you share with us about how you're doing in your yard. Okay, we have a couple questions about the bee boxes. Um, so specifically, will non-native bees try to use the bee boxes? No, the bee boxes, so non-native bees are looking for really large spaces. So these are the, the honeybees, European honeybees, which are the non-native bees around here. They're looking for, um, so that's when people have issues with them getting into like roof spaces. They need really large gaps to build a hive, a whole hive. Mm. These bee blocks are blocks of wood with very small, like with a drill bit, small holes mm. that were drilled in deep. And they're very narrow and there's really only space for maybe one bee <laughs> to climb through there. And that's exactly what these, these uh, native solitary, non-aggressive and mostly stingless bees are looking for. They need tight little tunnels that they can go in. And it's really interesting. They'll like pack some pollen and food in there and then lay an egg and put up a little like wax divider and put you know, more food and, and you know, leaf matter and pollen and nectar and then lay another egg. So they create these chambers where their babies develop and then they emerge one by one. So it's not the sort of thing where they would swarm or, or non-native bees would use it. But you'll see the little mothers all busy working their own individual holes, bringing in food for the babies. Wow, that's super cool. Very charming, yeah. yeah. I really enjoy my bee block. I watch it, you know, and, and they're active too. most of the year around here. Um, well, Pam asked if there's a resource for that you know of for identifying native bees. Native bees are tricky. Yeah, there, there are, if you, I can't remember what it is. I think U of A Extension has done a, a guide on some of the more common native bees. If you Google it, there are some good resources out there, but it, it's more works into categories because I've been trying to learn about this too. It's very difficult with 1200 little native bees. You kind of have to start, okay, there's the sweat bees and the leaf cutter bees and the bumblebees. So um, U of A has a pretty good guide and that's actually a good point. I'll see if I can find that. Um, but if, if you Google it, there are some good local resources for this. Native Plant Society just did a big presentation on it as well. Arizona Native Plant Society. Wow, yeah, I can imagine that's quite the challenge to try to get a good enough look at the bee too, so to figure out what it is. Um, so Brian would like to know, uh, is it safe to assume that an owl box should not be installed if you're also installing a Lucy's box? Actually, it's not so much of a problem. I would space them out a little bit more, but being offset in the active times, they're fairly safe. So for example, the owls are mostly active at night. Lucy's warblers by that time would be tucked away and safe in the nest box or somewhere else. So it's not, not something that you're you know putting them in danger or something with uh, having both. But um, I wouldn't have them like within feet of each other. So 20 feet or more is good to have them apart. Great. So I assume um, Brendan and Chris ask about having a screech owl in their yard. So that's okay yeah. to also put up a Lucy's Warbler box then. Yep, it's totally fine. Great. Um, I think I also saw a question there about uh, Phoenix, having nest boxes in Phoenix there. They are, Lucy's are found in Phoenix area. So definitely feel free to put one up, especially if you have mesquite trees nearby, Palo Verde, um, trees like that are, are gonna be attracting Lu uh, Lucy's warblers for you. Okay. 
Oh, a natural gourd last season. There's no reason for them not, you know, for you to not use that again. Um, that's kind of how we started our project is we started getting these pictures of Lucy's warblers using various designs of nest boxes. Uh, some of them were just decorative little rent houses and some of them were gourds that people put up. So that kind of how it all began and people or not people, but Lucy's warblers were our opportunistically using these cavities uh, for them. So no, no reason that you shouldn't do it. Um, definitely still good to have around this since they often come back to the same nest um, year after year. That's great to know. Yeah, really cool that you have one in the gorge. How awesome. Um, so yeah, I'll yeah. just say this out loud. Uh, this question was already answered in the chat, but uh, Ruth asked if you can buy the recipe cards in our nature shop. We actually, we have them for free. Uh, they're available if you want a hard copy of all of the recipes, um, they're in the nature shop. We also uh, have them online now, which Jenny um, put the link in the chat. So if anyone's interested in downloading those. Um, I think I read out all of the questions. If anyone else, if I missed your question or if anyone still has a question, uh, I think we still have a little time if you want to unmute yourselves and ask. I did see uh, one question there. I don't know if it was answered sure. or not, but, but bees in your um, water feature. So that often happens, especially during hot uh, summer months where the bees also need to drink and they come into your water dish and they end up drowning. So the reason that happens is because it's too deep for them. So what people do is they put rocks inside the water dish so that the, the bees can safely walk on the rocks and get just to like a shallow part where they can drink and fly off safely. Um, if you want to discourage them from coming to that particular dish, which I would still have a little bit of a shallow ledge there offered, you can also create a little drinker for bees specifically by putting a small dish, cover it in marbles or like little decorative uh, rocks and then filling that up with water just to the surface of the rocks. And then the bees can walk on the rocks and drink very safely and fly off. That's great. I think that came up about butterflies in our last Mm -hmm. uh, our last call, I would imagine that applies to butterflies as well, right? Yeah, definitely. Butterflies especially love uh, soaked soil. So if you want to create something like that, it would be soil even better for them where they'll, they're will they just going to cover that whole area and drink from just absorbing it from the soil. Just very, very, very damp soil. <laughs> awesome. Great. Thanks, Leah. There's a question um, about Flaverdes too, and um, from Keithan, hi Keithan, and I didn't um, know the answer offhand, so I just looked it up, and I went onto the Spadefoot Nursery website, which is actually their local nursery. Their their website is full of so much good information about native plants. Like they'll just pontificate about native plants, and you learn so much. So I highly recommend. But I just get I did get this information from them just now that uh, they're both native, the blue polyverde versus the foothill polyverde are both native polyverdes of the Tucson area, but that the blue um, is more frequently found in the plant nursery trade. So that is the one you tend to see most in yards, but that foothill is also available sometimes, but it is slower growing. So it's not used as frequently by um, nurseries, but that they're both excellent and that both of them can be bought at Spadefoot. <laughs> but they're both native. And, um, and also it looks like Foothills is a little more drought tolerant, but that they're both excellent. And I don't remember how to tell them apart. It has to do with like the blossom where the orange dot is. It's kind of tricky. It, there's, there's a way to do it. That's pretty reliable, but I can't remember, but they are both native. Awesome, thanks Jenny. Um, and great plug for Spadefoot. Um, I think that's everything. I'm really sorry if I missed your question. Feel free to, to either put it back in the chat or um, I see Mary just asked for the name of that nursery. I, I, if you scroll up a little bit in the chat, Mary, I put the name and the website. So yeah. uh, you can find that there. And it's um, spade foot, like, a, like the little toads. Oh yeah, good point, spade foot, yep. 
Um, so yeah, if I missed anyone, um, please feel free to, to re-ask your question either out loud or in the chat. Um, a couple more minutes. I just want to say it's such a great turnout. Thank you all for coming. It's awesome. Let's get those Lucy's some houses. <laughs> yes, and this is actually a great later. time. Uh, I will give a plug for our upcoming birds and beer event that'll be in person. Um, on February 24th, we'll be meeting at Tucson Hop Shop, uh, which is, I believe, in northern uh, part of Tucson. Um, I can put that information in the chat as well. The registration is open on our website and we're gonna be celebrating Lucy's Warblers because at the end of February. So perfect timing and Olia will be there to answer all of your questions and we'll be selling some of our Lucy's Warbler nest boxes at that event. So uh, if you're interested in learning more or uh, just coming out and seeing us for that event, we, we welcome you to register today or whenever. Um, I'm going to guess that there are no more questions. I haven't seen any hands. Nothing's come through in the chat. So I think we can safely wrap up. Um, let's give a huge thank you and virtual round of applause to our speakers, Olia and Jenny. Um, they are available if you have any more questions. Um, and we will have this recording up hopefully uh, today or tomorrow, but definitely next week for sure on YouTube. And I'll send that link out as soon as it's ready. So you can go back and, and watch any of the parts that that interest you um, and we just really appreciate that you took your time out today to join us and learn how to track some Lucy's Warblers to your yard so thank you so much thanks everyone thank, thank you, you so much for coming <laughs> all right take care have a good rest of your day thanks again